very much for coming. It's very good to have you all here. So I thought I'd better say a little bit just to introduce myself, really, because I'm, I'm relatively new to the area, although my partner's from this neck of the woods and has been living around and just opposite um, from this very hall, in fact, is, is her parents live. So I, I kind of am reasonably grounded, but myself not. But for many years, I've, uh, I've been working for an organisation called Earthwatch up until about uh, two years ago. And Earthwatch is very much into research and citizen science and biodiversity. And I spent a lot of time working with big corporate companies, trying to get them to think a little bit more about sustainability. They'll understand a little bit more about climate change, a little bit more about why it's important that people act and do something to at least try and mitigate. And with big, ugly corporates, um, it's not always that easy. You kind of make a, a connection with people at an individual level, but of course these are huge organisations to turn around. And it could be a little bit of, a little bit, shall we say, disheartening. Um, and I sort of thought to myself, well, actually, it's much better to see things happening at grassroots level where people can really make a difference and people really care, and you can actually do something, you have agency to do something yourselves. So this is why I'm very excited to be part of this, this project. Most recently, a couple of you may have heard of the, of the CLEAN project. It was run by the um, Growing Better Connections, um, Kumarian uh, Renewable Energy. It was uh, testing water quality on the River Nevin. Um, and I know a couple of people certainly here were involved in, in taking samples of water on the River Nevin. And I was the guy who was uh, tasked by the Growing Better Connections folk to write the reports that you may have seen or may not have seen on that work. So if you, if you are interested in, in, in knowing a little bit more about the the uh, fortunes of the River Nevin and the work that we did that, then, then, then uh, get in touch with me and I can put you in that direction. But that's who I am. That's what I've done most recently while I've been in Newport. As Siobhan's already said, this really was spawned about a year ago, just before lockdown, um, with the meeting which prompted these little, little uh, post-it notes. And of those post-it notes, I've been through them all and I've actually looked to see what was said. And it, it basically boiled down to five different things. There was trees, there was gardens, and wanting to understand about what they could do, what people could do in their, wild, in their gardens for wildlife. There were, uh, for spin-off from that, was like making meadows or making mini meadows where you could. Uh, there was uh, a little piece about citizen science, which kind of, and then something that the town council also picked up on with the, with the River Nevin, the clean project wanting uh, to, to sort of understand a little bit about how people get involved in gathering data about the, society, about the environment that we live in. And finally, there was an area, a little piece about you know, wildlife corridors and open, open spaces for biodiversity. And as Siobhan's rightly said, all of those things have really been brought into the, this, this project. And again, I shall give a shout out to the Sustainable Development Funding as well for letting this happen, the National Park, the uh, Pembrokeshire Coast National Park Authority. Um, and so from the application we put in, it, there are four components really, which, uh, which is kind of a repeat of what I've just said in a way, because there is tree planting, and Paul Harris will talk a little bit more about that, um, but we do want to plant a tree um, for every person in Newport, we'll need some ideas for sites and where we can do it, um, but the tree planting piece is a really, really important part that I think will appeal to all of the community. There is a wildlife gardening piece, so we definitely want as many people as possible to do little interventions within their gardens. Uh, to encourage nature and the more people that do that we can start building networks of gardens um, I don't know whether any of you have come across the idea of hedgehog highways the idea that if you have enough gardens together and you put little holes in the fence so that the hedgehogs can come and go then suddenly rather than just having your garden to play in they've got a whole street's worth of gardens and as long as we look after them on the road as well then suddenly we've made corridors and room for, for, for organisms and for species and for animals and birds that wouldn't normally have a chance. So the idea of getting as many people as possible just to make these little interventions, um, we'll be talking about a lot more. My intention is to have workshops and, um, and, and some talks on the subject. We're going to hopefully bring in some people that know even a, a hell of a lot more about these things than I do over the course of the next 18 months, which I invite you all to. Keep an eye out. We'll be having newsletters and, and updates on Facebook and all that social media horror um, to, uh, to keep you informed about what's going on. But the idea over the next sort of 18 months or now 15 months is to start sharing the ideas that you can all have and bringing together people as, as, as the community here to do as much as possible in their own way. And again, we've got a couple of people sitting at this table here, Matt Horgan and Richard Wheeler. Uh, for, later, for later on, feel willing to go and speak to them or be happy and, and please go and speak to them about what, what they do in their wildlife gardening and how they, how they, uh, and the knowledge that they have about, about wildlife and, and wildlife gardening. Spin off from that, a lot of people wanted to know about meadows. So again, we've got people from meadows here. 
Um, Clive Morgan in the corner there is going to be doing a little bit on, on his rehabilitation of his meadows. Um, and he's got some, some leaflets there that have come from the Magnificent Meadows people. So I don't know if you've come across the Magnificent Meadows plant life. There's a Pembrokeshire Meadows group now. So those of you that are interested in meadows um, and want to know more, Pembrokeshire um, um, what Magnificent Meadows group is, is the way to go. Um, and we've also got um, Dr. Kevin McGinn from um, the uh, Saving Pollinators um, initiative at the uh, National Botanic Gardens. Again, lots of information about flowers you can plant and, and pollinator friendly uh, plants and so on there. So all that sort of stuff is going to be going on. I'm hoping that you'll get a lot more information about the whole wildlife gardening component as the project goes on. And then the third bit was the, was the wildlife recording piece. Really important that we actually know what's out there. What are the declines? Um, I don't know whether any of you have come across the idea of, um, of, of sliding baselines, but the fact that we don't really know what, what, what the way in which biodiversity is, is falling away because we, we don't really know what our grandparents knew and our children won't know what we knew, so they'll think what is going on is the new normal because they just don't know the fact that 50 years ago there were lapwings filling the skies or whatever it might be, curlews, whatever. So. So in order to really understand what is out there in the fields and the gardens and the lanes and the footpaths and the byways around Newport, we really need to record them. So I'm really hoping that all of you here will sign up to the West Wales Biodiversity Information Centre app and start inputting data. Colin and his colleague here are from uh, the WWBIC. Again, please go and feel free to talk to them after this and learn more about what they do and why they do it. And I'm really encouraging you all to start observing as you're out and about and making note of species. And again, I'll be updating in the, uh, in the newsletter about the sort of species we're looking out for. And then finally is the public open spaces, the amenity areas, which are, which are often mown so vigorously in order to keep the place looking tidy. Um, and that can be more difficult, but a lot of people have said, look, why are we doing this? Why can't we have some more wildflower areas in some of our open spaces? So that's the, the final bit of the jigsaw really was to try and slot that in. And that's not going to be that easy. It does then really depend who owns them, why they are mown like that, what reasons it might be. Is it, a, is it a safety, road safety thing? Is it a trunk road thing? Whatever. But it can be done. And I'm very pleased to welcome um, uh, Mr. Mike Kendall from St. Dogmails, the county council, uh, community council there. And he's also going to be speaking a little to us all about the work that he's been doing and his group there in in trying to get um, biodiversity and public open space managed to improve wildflowers and pollinators and biodiversity there. So a little bit more about that from him shortly. So that's that. Um, why are we doing this? Well, we've already mentioned biodiversity loss has been one of the key things. And as you possibly know, scientists are increasingly talking about the fact that we're edging towards the sixth mass extinction. The last one being that of the dinosaurs about 69 million years ago. And we're edging into that situation now where we are on the cusp of another great mass extinction unless we decide to do something about biodiversity loss. Climate change resilience, as, they, as, uh, as Siobhan's already mentioned, trees massively important in that, shading and cooling, flood alleviation, erosion reduction, and increasing the diversity of species. Green spaces instead of tarmac, trying to maximise the amount of green space that we've got to soak up rain. Flooding is going to be one of the big issues, so all we can do to try and increase the value of the green spaces that we've got and enhance them is always going to be a benefit both for climate resilience but also in terms of biodiversity. And then of course corridors. Climate change is going to mean that things need to move across landscapes and they struggle when they've got to get, get across the M4 or they've got to get across vast areas of relatively habitat poor landscapes. So creating corridors for movement of species is going to be critically important and again that comes down to us acting as a community to create a network of, of, of wild spaces and wildlife friendly spaces for animals and plants to move across the landscape and be able to, to move as they need to. And one of the key things to remember here about this whole idea of, of connectivity and resilience is bigger, better and better connected. And that's really what we're trying to do here. We're trying to make bigger areas for wildlife, better areas for wildlife, and we're trying to connect them up so they're bigger, better and better connected. Again, it's been mentioned already, but well-being, the idea that uh, an attractive place in terms of flowers and, and nature, knowing that we've done something to create that, is going to make us feel better, it's going to be better for mental health. And again, we don't want to bang on about the whole lockdown business, but we all know that we've been so reliant on our little 15 minutes of exercise and gardens and places to be able to sit and feel at peace and feel joyful and feel relaxed. And of course, that's what we really get from, from nature. 
Um, and then finally, I would just say, and again, Siobhan also mentioned it, but I shall mention it again. It's something that we can all do. There are probably lots of things in the world at the moment that we rail against, that we're not happy about. And I'm not even going to mention it because this is not meant to be a political rally. But there are probably things that you just think, I can't, re I don't know what to do. I'm help I, mean, I know things need to change, but I don't know how to do it. And just working in your own community, changing your own garden, changing the place you live, changing the street you live in, for the better, it gives you a chance to at least feel you're, you're, you're making a contribution, making a change for the better. And uh, I think that's really important for us all to recognise uh, that we can do something. So that's really what this project is about, I hope. Um, and that's really all I have to say, other than to say thank you very much again for coming along. We've got a host of other speakers, well not a host, a few other speakers that are going to enlarge on what I've spoken about. Um, Mr Paul Harris from the Town Council is going to be up next um, to talk a little bit about the project of the Town Council and to talk a little bit about the tree planting component which is very much um, from that, that, that direction. As I've already said, uh, Clive Morgan there is going to do a little bit about meadows. Um, I'm delighted to say that um, Mary Chadwick is here from the National Coast Path Biodiversity Officer to give a little bit of the wider context and why this is so important from a National Park's point of view. And then, as I've already mentioned, Mike Pender will come and, and, and give us a little piece around, uh, around what they've done in St Dogmals and how it is possible to make quite significant differences um, in terms, of, in terms of, uh, of the public open space as well, which is so important to all of us. That's my lot. Thank you for listening. Um, an impressive gathering, I think. Uh, uh, so, my name is Paul Harris, I'm the Chairman of Pembroke Coast National Park and uh, a Newport Town Councillor. And I'm here mainly as Newport Town Council to show sort of uh, what support Newport Town Council have done to this, uh, have given to this biodiversity project. So, around that, Paul, we've got to draft. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Newport. Can I start by thanking Richard for asking me to speak, and to Siobhan, and all the NAG for getting this exciting project underway. Um, a bit of background in Newport, I, I, I've got to go back a few years. One of the first references that I'm aware of regarding trees in the area is the felling of trees in Pengethi Forest to make a new bridge for Newport Castle in 1398. <laughs> George Owen Henley, then, writing about 1600, complained about the cutting down and subsequent lack of trees in Aberigian. So nothing's new. Uh, we're revisiting this again. With a reference to the Nature Project and regarding biodiversity, I came across an account written in 1966. And this uh, is referencing what you spoke about, Richard, you know, what was there before. Uh, in 1996, a huge variety of birds in Newport, ringed oozles, corn crake and quail were mentioned, as were their visitors, hoopoe, spoonbill and kite. Now I don't know what a hoopoe is, I hope some of you do, but apparently they were around in 1966. Are they around now? No. But it would be interesting to know how this picture looks now, so maybe as part of this project we can, we can check on that. Uh, with, with regard to birds again, the only white-tailed eagle recorded in the county was shot in the Priscilla's in 1907, on a Sunday of all days. <laughs> Should we consider a reintroduction programme of this magnificent bird? I know the National Park are looking at this. With regard to mammals, otters, weasels and stoats were recorded, with polecats and pine martins being less common. How are these populations doing now? I don't think we've got any pine martins around. But 1966, they were about. As for flowers, the Newport century was first discovered in this locality. Is it still thriving? Does anybody know? No. It's still hanging on. It's still hanging on. Yes. Great. Great. But again, you know, a flower named after Newport, we should be more aware of it. You know. At the turn of the century, herring were plentiful <coughs> and exported from Newport to the Mediterranean. In my lifetime, mackerel were abundant. That's not so now. Should we, you know, on a wider scale of things, should we be considering a, a marine national park here in Pembrokeshire to be the first in the UK 
really interesting idea I think we should be pursuing. Closer to our time, 1970, well, 51 years ago, it was Europe, European Conservation Year, when a concerted effort was made to conserve all that is important and un unique in our natural environment heritage. Newport Primary School, led by the he head teacher, Iskreen Jenkins, produced a very good booklet looking around Newport Pens. The school's efforts were safeguarding the footpaths. I'd recommend a review of this book and the walks it describes, the listing of the trees that existed at the time and the small woodlands along the pilgrim's path make interesting reading. So again, what you were saying, Richard, we need to look at what was happened before to see where we're going now. There are too many people to mention who have made a contribution to recording and promoting the wildlife and conservation of Newport, but here are just a few that I know. John Seymour of Ahonle, author and pioneer in the self-sufficiency self movement, who wrote the book, The Complete Book of Self-Sufficiency. I think his legacy is, is, is still with us today. Councillor Robin Evans, Councillor Peter Harwood and David Vaughan, who researched the 1995 book, The Canningly Walks, edited by Brian John. Uh, the trees alongside the Burma Road, that's the marsh path at the bottom of Long Street running to Paro, were planted with the help of David Vaughan, uh, a, a Newport uh, resident. Brian John was also a founder, I believe, of Newport Eco Centre at the old school. It was on this site that the first and smallest commercial solar PV installation in the UK started to feed electricity into the grid on the 11th of October 1996, pioneering what is now a vast industry. At that point, Newport should be really proud of, of, of something like that that's happened. So um, you, we really are standing on the shoulders of giants in Newport. So Newport Town Council established a brief friendly scheme at Brynhoverry Cemetery, one of the first schemes in Wales, and also supported the clean uh, Nevin project, which you've heard about from Richard, surveying the river for nitrates and phosphates. Stage two of this project is currently looking for funding. So if you're interested, talk to me or talk to Richard. Very happy to hear from you. In recent years, there have been considerable tree planting efforts in and around Newport, with thousands of trees being planted on the fringes of Mountain West, Prithdir, um, New Road and adjacent to the Kelvin Road. Newport Town Council came up with the idea of planting one tree for every person on the electoral roll, the total being 1,161 trees. If every community in Pembrokeshire replicated this, the total would be about 130,000 trees. Um, 1,161 is a nominal figure. It's, it's, it's something to hang a hook on. So, uh, as a start, let's think about 1,161. If we plant 2,000, marvellous. It doesn't matter. Um, I think having a target to aim at is a good idea, and with your help, and facilitated by NAEG, I think we can secure the engagement of locals, second homeowners, visitors, and the school to make this and other project, projects achievable. Diolch <laughs> Um, thank you for that. Very good. Um, okay, next up, if I may point to Mr. Clive Morgan, um, he's just going to say a few words about meadows because a lot of people have been asking about meadows. And I also know there are almost certainly a lot of people or a number of people in the audience here that also have, have their own meadows and have their own knowledge of, of, of growing meadows. Um, but I just wanted to sort of open it up a bit from gardens and say, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of exciting things that are happening. So Clive volunteered just to come and say a few words about what he's been doing up on, up by, uh, up by uh, Kilburn Road. The, uh, the purpose of being invited to talk was to give you an indication of what I and my good lady wife have actually done with regard to two meadows on the side of Carnegie, which we bought in 2010. One of them is two acres, one of them is four acres. Uh, and we have carried out a programme to try and rehabilitate them. I've got some photographs to show what they were like at the start. It's useful from our purposes to go back and see 
exactly how things have changed during that period. Um, so they were existing meadows, in inverted commas, but very, very different in character. The two-acre one, which I, was the only one I wanted to buy, but um, the lady who, who sold them to me was good enough to make it a double purchase. Uh, thin soil, east-facing slope, grassland for silage and grazing pretty intensively. Uh, it had fertilizer applied. Uh, at some stage, in fact, uh, when we did our initial uh, survey, uh, there were 16 species of grasses and flowering plants in the sward. So we weren't starting with nothing. We were starting, though, with something which uh, had been used for fairly intensive stock grazing and silage production. It also had a serious problem with invasive brackle, bramble and bracken at the edges. But it was capable in those days of producing 65 small bales of hay or 9 to 11 big bales of, of haylage or silage. In contrast, the field we didn't want to buy it but did had even thinner soil. It was virtually non-existent. A really rocky substrate, uh, east facing again, steep, boulder strewn, wonderful boulders. It was grazed irregularly because it was burned frequently. The former tenant stopped me in the road one day to say, you don't want to grow anything there, lad, he said, because I sprayed azulox on it. Uh, however, he didn't know much about the biodegradability of azulox. It was dominated by bramble and bracken and gorse. I've got a photograph to show you bracken this high. Little ground cover, probably under the bramble and bracken, there were no more than two or three species. Uh, but in places, there were some young trees actually trying to come through. So that was the situation in 2010, 2011, 2012, because we spent the first couple of years looking at it and deciding uh, what we needed to do. We needed to know a bit more about it to start off with. By 2021, we have a light grazing regime on the two-acre field. We are controlling the invasives with a fair degree of success, uh, using some volunteers uh, uh, as well. The dung is removed as it's generated on a daily basis. One hour a day I spend picking up that dung because we want to impoverish the, uh, the uh, nutrient status. As of this June, we had 43 species in the sward. In late July, early August, we took 200 bales of really good hay off that, uh, off that meadow because we wanted to recreate a herb-rich hay meadow. And we can look around us from our field and there is nothing comparable in our view, with the exception of a little bit of Brith Mauer, that is comparable to our field because everything else seems to have perennial ryegrass and uh, uh, we can look at one farm, they've had five cuts of silage off one of the farms in our view this year. No chance for much wildlife uh, and, and plant diversity under those circumstances. So 43 species now. The interesting thing is because we do spend some time watching it, observing it and sort of recording what's there, the composition and proportion of uh, species, grasses and flowering herbs, actually varies quite considerably from year to year. And we're not interfering with that, it's doing it all by itself. So, we're working on the basis that we're not planting anything, we're not sowing any seeds, stuff is moving back in, or the seed bank was there anyway. We've had three species of orchid appear, although the principal one is common spotted. Uh, yellow rattle, eye bright, sorrel. Um, last year the highlight for me was two big patches of wax cap fungi. Uh, very, very neglected area, uh, uh, the study of fungi. But they're telling us that probably we're going in very much the right direction. This year, a fantastic crop of common field mushroom. Right, okay. The four acres 
Um, how are things going there? Uh, oh, we could do with a few volunteers. We had nine people the weekend before last actually helping us remove bracken. Um, we're pulling uh, uh, bracken, uh, cutting bracken with a scythe. Um, we're only burning the, uh, the bramble rootstocks. We've got light grazing again, dung removal. A good ground cover is returning. Uh, when you see the photographs later on, you'll be able to appreciate that with bracken this high and bramble underneath it and mixed in with it, virtually nothing was growing on the ground. But uh, now we're getting, we've probably got about 15 or 16 species actually within that swarm, including lots of um, uh, tormentil, for example, uh, bird <coughs> foot trefoil. Um, but interestingly, uh, if you look hard enough, you can find wood anemone. You can find wood sage. Uh, this particular paddock is actually telling us it wants to be woodland again. This year, within this paddock, I've counted over 200 small oak trees. Now, that ties in with what we thought might be going to happen there, because we've created some small amounts of, uh, of uh, tree planting, and I'd like to introduce you to Raymond. <laughs> Raymond was uh, an oak acorn last year. Uh, this is one year's growth, he's doing quite well. And Raymond is in memory of uh, a good friend. So <laughs> our field is now what we call, well part of it, our field of memories. Because one way to identify with what you're planting and to look after them, and this is a really important point, you don't plant things hoping them to survive without any sort of care and maintenance. So Raymond will get looked after in exactly the same way as all the other trees that have got little tags on them that say they are dedicated to the memory of an individual. And maybe that's an idea to take away, actually, for all the trees that the, uh, uh, the town council are hoping you're going to plant, plant. So how we actually got from there to there is actually a process, which I can talk you through if you like. And it sort of ties in with the leaf that the Meadows people have actually produced. But it's not just about the plants. <coughs> um, we have... Adders, bumble, adders, adders. <laughs> We've got some big adders actually on that slope, particularly in the four acre field. Bumblebees, butterflies, badgers, common lizard, dung beetles, dragonflies, hoverflies, moles, moths, including the tiger moth. We've got a big patch of bramble which seems to support the tiger moth larvae. Uh, three foot six grass snake is our biggest. Uh, slow worms, four, five together. Uh, in some points, toads, hedgehogs, field mice, rabbits, field voles, a pain, they eat the, uh, the trees. Skylarks, five years running, we've had skylarks nest in the, uh, the two acre uh, meadow. And we've had single sightings of muntjac and roe deer. And this is just on the edge of, um, uh, of Newport. What we're bad at, and what I'm going to confess to the biodiversity recording people over there is that uh, while we have data, while we collect data, we don't pass it on to anyone. And clearly that's got to be a very, very important part of this project. So that we can monitor change for the better, hopefully, but we might also be monitoring change for the worst. So really heartened by the number of people here because this is a really good basis on which to start what is quite a, uh, a difficult project actually because it's changing perceptions as much as uh, uh, changing the nature of the environment in which we're actually living in. Thank you very much. Um, and I've invited her along really to give just a little bit of a bigger picture on how what we do here could potentially help 
the rest of the park achieve their goals and, um, and, and so on. So thank you, Mary. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. But yeah, so by day I'm a conservation officer at the National Park. By night I'm involved in the Pembrokeshire Bat Group and also the amphibian and reptile group. So I'm talking about lots of things with various hats on. Uh, Newport is an outstanding area for wildlife. Some of our rarest and most threatened species are still thriving here despite declining at a national level. And they all rely on well-connected networks of habitat. And they all benefit from things that we can do either as gardeners, landowners, farmers, or as citizen scientists at recording them. First of all, the greater horseshoe bat. This chap here. It's one of our biggest bats. It's got a wingspan of a foot. Um, it's one of the rarest in Europe. And just outside Newport, there's a maternity roost of greater horseshoes. It was only discovered 21 years ago with 53 bats. There are now 614. Pretty good. They feed on large beetles and moths, and they rely on dark corridors of hedgerows and woodland edges to get around. One individual bat will easily fly 16 kilometres in a night from its roost to go and feed. And they'll travel a lot further to get to their hibernation sites to mine adits and caves. And so they need a vast area of species-rich habitat to forage over with these, these well-connected corridors that have to be dark, so you need to minimise light pollution or they won't cross the, an area. We've also got the lesser horseshoe bat, which is a, a smaller version of the greater horseshoe. Um, and uh, there's a breeding population of them somewhere near Newport. We find them in Nevin at a particular location until April, and then they disappear. And they're going somewhere to breed, but we don't know where. So you can borrow a, a bat detector from the um, uh, Pembrokeshire Nature Partnership, and you can go out and just wander around at night and just see where you pick them up and it could give us a clue as to where they're going. Another species with its main stronghold in Newport is the Dormouse. You can't not love a Dormouse. It, it seems to be the only place in Pembrokeshire where it's actually doing well, and it makes very good use, again, of hedgerows as well as woodlands. They even turn up in gardens on the edges of Cunningley, so garden hedges are just as important as ones out of the countryside. Again, they need large networks of woodlands and hedgerows. And they also need a wide diversity of species in those hedgerows. So they all produce flowers and fruits at different times to keep them fed through the year. And they even make good use of sycamore because it flowers later than the, the native species of trees. Um, so actually having a sycamore in your garden is no bad thing if you've got dormice in the area. Dormice chew hazelnuts in a very characteristic way. Um, I've got a little selection of dormouse chewed hazelnuts here. So if you go walking in the autumn and you find hazelnuts with a really neat round hole, it's worth having a closer look with a hand lens. If they've got an inner edge that has concentric rings going around it, made by the teeth, then it's been eaten by a dormouse. If the lines are like the, the radii of a circle going out, then that's been a, a wood mouse or a bank bowl. So if ever you're in any doubt, you can send, send a selection of nuts to the, the County Mammal Recorder or to us at the National Park. We'll have a look and see what we think. And just let us know where and when you found them. That's the key. Adders have been mentioned. Um, there's an adder there. They're declining seriously in Britain now. We're really quite concerned about them. They've gone extinct from several counties in England. But they seem to be doing well in Pembrokeshire and on Cunningley. Uh, especially doing well in, on the coast of Pembrokeshire, I should say. But we don't know what their long-term prospects are like because we haven't analysed the structure of the populations. Adders really love Pembrokeshire hedge banks and dry stone walls because they can hibernate in them. They've got lovely crevices that they can hide away in. And banks with gorse along the top are particularly valuable because they give really good thermal stability. They also use areas of bracken and gorse, which give them shelter. When they're emerging from hibernation, they need to warm up. They need to be able to lie in somewhere that gets the sun, but is sheltered from the wind. And bracken and bramble is ideal for that. So any records of, of adders that are basking in March or April are really, really useful, because they'll be very close to where they were hibernating. So you can join the Pembrokeshire Athubian and Reptile Group. 
and go along with some real expert surveyors who are brilliant at spotting them and just learn how to look for them, how to pick them up. Adults also need really well connected areas of habitat. So they need their gorsy hedge banks for winter hibernation. They need marshy grassland and wet areas during the summer where they eat a lot of amphibians. And they need networks of bracken and gorse throughout linking all these areas up. So if you can dig a pond, then that's going to benefit adders and grass snakes and, of course, amphibians as well. The National Park funded a radio tracking project this spring on Stromble Head, where they put radio tags on seven adders and followed them until the middle of June when they stuffed their skins and lost their tags. So staff and volunteers went out every two to three days for three months, tracking exactly where each adder was. They found that each female stays in a fairly small home range, but the males travelled a long way, and they were using Pembrokeshire hedge banks and gorse and bramble to move through quite improved farmland, and they would go a kilometre from their normal habitat where you'd expect to find them. There was one male who seemed to spend the whole summer in a hedge bank on a really improved dairy farm, so they really could be anywhere. And finally, marsh fertility butterflies. That's this lovely one. Where's it gone? There, that one there. It's one of our most rapidly declining butterflies, and it depends on the flower Devil's Bit Scabious, which its caterpillars feed on. There are good populations of it in the Gwine Valley, and there have been some records on the slopes of Carningley as well. The butterflies don't normally fly more than a kilometre or two from where they were born. But they can travel a bit further if they're not too heavy with eggs. They can get about five kilometres from, from where they hatched. So it's worth looking after any devil's bit scabious that you have on your land, in your meadows, and also any honeysuckle in your hedgerows, because that's another really useful food plant for the caterpillars. Devil's bit scabious is flowering at the moment. It's one of our latest flowers to appear, and so it's really valuable for pollinators when there's not much else around. If you look at any patch of scabious on a warm day, it's smothered in bees and hoverflies, butterflies. It's also something that sheep love to eat, so very often it disappears from areas where sheep have grazed heavily. But on the other hand, if you've now got cattle or pony grazing instead, it can, it can recover. So the National Park have got a project for the next year and a half to collect seeds from devil's scabious and then grow them into plug plants and plant them back into the areas where we have lost them, but where we've now got suitable grazing, so they can actually do well. It's something, again, that anyone can get involved in. You can just go and collect some seeds, grow them in any old containers in peat-free compost, and um, then find, find someone who's happy to have some plugs planted out on their land. So finally, just a few bits of advice for, for gardeners and landowners. If you're gardeners, Please avoid using herbicides and pesticides unless you're dealing with something really obnoxious like Japanese knotweed. If possible, try avoid cutting your lawn during May and June and leave a few bits even longer if you can. Collect up the cuttings and compost them and then you'll get all sorts of things in your compost heap like bumblebees, grass snakes, voles. If you've got a fence, cut a hole in the bottom like we said earlier and then you'll get hedgehogs coming through. Look out for hedgehog droppings, which are actually quite big and chunky and easy to spot. Try having something in flower all year round if you can, then you've always got nectar and pollen available. Even willow is actually really important as a pollen source for bees. I don't think it matters too much in a garden if you've got non-native species, because often it helps you extend the, the range of flowering times. For landowners, Having a mosaic of habitats is really, really valuable. So let your hedgerows grow upwards and outwards so they can flower and fruit every year. And, and let some trees grow to their full size as well. Keep a few patches of gorse or bramble where you can. I know they do invade and they creep in from the edges, but having them at those edges is really, really valuable. Allow plants to flower and set seed and leave nesting birds undisturbed, obviously. And on a landscape scale, if you've got a mixture of, of both hay meadows and pasture, then that's really valuable because each has different benefits. And the same is true for grazing animals, a mixture of cattle, ponies, sheep and goats. 
is great, greatest for giving a good diversity. The National Park can match up landowners with graziers if people don't have their own animals but, but want a meadow grazed. Again, avoid using artificial fertilisers, slurry, pesticides. Tree planting is wonderful, but just check first that you're not planting trees on species-rich grassland. For, for 18 years now, the National Park have been running a scheme called Conserving the Park, where we just give advice and support to anyone who wants to manage their land for wildlife, however big or small. And the idea is to, just to have bigger, better, more joined up areas for wildlife. We've now got 185 sites in the scheme, covering 1,380 hectares. And we have really good connectivity, simply because you get a domino effect of neighbouring farms all wanting to get involved. So anyone's welcome to, to get in touch with us about their land, and we will promise not to give you any paperwork. So I'll put some slips on the table there, just with my sort of contact details on, my email address, if anyone wants to get in touch. And you can get in touch with me for, for the bat group or amphibian reptile group as well. So, thank you for listening. Yeah. And thank you very much for some of those pieces of advice. Um, finally, uh, um, before I come back and say a little bit more, um, just a few minutes, um, I'd like to call on, on, on Mike Kendall from St. Dogs, St. Dog Mills um, Community Council, just to show what's going on there and the fact that even planting open, uh, public open space is coming down and uh, yeah, the community can be brought to the side and uh, it's a, with encouraging words. Here we are. Mike. You are, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> He's bribing for encouraging words. Thanks <laughs> for along. Um, I'm, I'm Mike from the St Dog Mills Community Council. We had a village plan back in 2010, long before my time on the council, um, and part of that was biodiversity. And we didn't do too much. We had one very, very forward-thinking councillor, Jill, who decided she wanted to get rid of invasive species. So not Japanese knotweed and Himalayan balsam. So she worked non-stop on that for five, six years. Because most of the areas of free space are just coming with it. So that's what really sort of kicked it off. It was the, you know, the plan, Jill doing all his hard work. That took us up to 2016, we had the Orchard Project. I see you've stolen Nia from us. <laughs> We're going to get her back, don't you worry. Um, so she got a very successful project with Sophie uh, from the Primbarian. Um, and it was so popular that people were really, really behind it. The villagers were behind it. Um, so, always lagging behind, the community council thought, well, hang on a minute, we're missing out on something here. So, we thought we, we would look at our land and see what we could, could do. But before that, we'd already identified a couple of areas that PCC managed for us. So, we spoke with our local councillor, Mike James, and got in contact with PCC. And we run, was, we call them verges, they're sort of slopes on the side of a the road. They're not classified as verges, they're classified as the medium size. So we worked along with two of those, we just changed the cussing regime. So part of the deal was they would change their cussing regime, we would monitor it. And that really worked. We, what was just grass or nothing turning into sort of, you know, with all sorts of different flowers coming through. So we thought, right, how can we look at that? So roll forward in 2019, we had this great idea. Back in January 2019, we'd look at all the areas the community council up in and see what we could do. Um, obviously it wasn't the best year to start the projects off. Um, but we identified seven areas and one very large area which was the Pinnock. So if anyone's been down to the dog mouths and walked along the riverfront there, that area is an SSSI already, but it was just it was just wasteland. Nothing at all. And uh, excuse me, you won't be able to see it right in the back, but I'll leave them laying around. That's what it looked like basically. <laughs> we were cutting it once a month. As soon as it started to grow, we'd come along and cut it. So, we looked at that and we, had, we could see it had potential. So, 2019, we sort of monitored the areas, we tried to identify what could be there. We didn't have a plan, as some other people have already said, to, to seed or anything like that. We just wanted to see if it was left and managed in a different way, what could be done. So, this year is our first full year, as I say, it's coming to an end now or actually leaving it, we changed the cutting regime. And we were sort of, it was difficult because we wanted to get the people involved. 
but obviously we couldn't because we couldn't have meetings, we couldn't even have something like this. So we took a little bit on our, sort of, our own back um, and we've had very mixed reactions to some areas. So we've sort of swapped that again, we've, we've, we've turned it around. So you've got to be flexible. It's no good just saying, right, we're going to do that and stick with it. You've got to listen to people and you've got to be prepared to go, well, actually, that hasn't worked. So why hasn't it worked? So at the moment we're in the middle of it, we're sort of, you know, we haven't set a, oh, it's a three year project, so we're fortunate because it's run by the community council. We're just ongoing monitoring, but next year we're not making any changes to the actual cutting pattern we've done this year. But we've already seen quite a few positive benefits. I mean, that's a prime example, that's just short, dry grass, you get a dry spell like we just had, it just turned brown. And that, this is from a video, so I'm afraid the pictures are not that great. But those you can see is that same area. And if you look at it, um, it's full of medley sweet, uh, various plants. But have a look, I'll even look at the back here. So that, in a year, is how we change one barren area to something. And if you go down there now, it's, I mean, I was down, I'm down there virtually every week. It's packed with butterflies, bees, pollinators. People are actually down there now, whereas they were just sort of, you know, it'd be somewhere where they take their dog, the dog does what it has to do and away they go. Now they're down with their children, they're taking an interest. It's really made a sort of difference. Um, so we've noticed a, sort of, you know, a massive increase in pollinator insect. The plants we did monitor, unfortunately we didn't send them red data to you, but we, we made sure that we had a check taken in 2019 as best we could, so we could monitor it against what, what had disappeared, what had increased, and how things were doing. Um, visitors, I mean, because I, I, I'm down there a lot, a lot of people, and I talk a lot, as you probably go, but those that don't know, you can shut up here. Um, it, it was great, because you'd be down there, so, you know, obviously the residents knew about it, and people would come along and say, oh, now, what are you doing? Because I've got the possum stuck up in here, you know. So, and so you sort of chat to them and I say, oh, this is great. Oh, perhaps we could do something back home. You know, it could be from England, people from Scotland. Or we had one couple who came along and they actually moved to the village because they were house hunting. And there's nobody from Kilgarran here, is there? No, that's good. They were looking at a house in Kilgarran. And then they came down they, and we had a chat and they were, had a, they were viewing in the house and uh, some dog mails. And lo and behold, they moved here, partly because they could see that what we were doing with the biodiversity. So I'm not saying it's the only reason. I mean, it's one of the reasons. When I spoke to them afterwards, they said, well, it was partly because what you were saying was it, you know, everyone seemed so enthusiastic. Uh, <clears throat> well, this is one for probably the town council, cost savings. Last year, we didn't make any cost savings. In fact, it cost us slightly more because we had to rearrange what was the previous sort of cutting contract into the next one. So there were some cuts we wanted to pull forward that came back into the previous year. So cost us a little bit more, but overall what we've found, and the other worry we had was would we lose our contractor? Because if you cut too much, it's not worth you doing it. So we looked as well as other areas. So the moment we would save in year two, how would we use, utilize the contractor to make it worthwhile for intending for the uh, for the work and also how can we improve other areas so we, we look closely across that so we just swapped his work over so he's doing less cutting he's only cutting that three times or two times a year but we made sure there was other work and really doing wasn't just making it up to go along but we just looked at the whole area so in fact out of the biodiversity into what would be good in other areas of fact previously we had not we have done, we've had volunteers doing. At the moment, we can't use volunteers, or we haven't been able to use volunteers. So that's how we worked around the contract. It's a sort of, um, it's quite a, an issue, certainly in smaller community councils, and I presume smaller town councils. One of the other big benefits is, like here, a lot of the areas state banks. So, whereas we were getting it cut, so the grass was two inches long, it rained, it washed the soil down, it made the side to side and collapse. This year already we've noticed a big change. So we've let the grass grow, the flowers are now taking root, plants are actually getting stuck in. And we've 
that erosion is virtually, I wouldn't say it's soft 100%, but it's really, really salt. So that's an, a knock-on effect. So not only is the bank not eroding, but the wash down is not getting onto the pathways. So we're saving an effort there, we're making it safer. One particular slope that's tarmac, we're going to wash down. I mean, you wouldn't want to walk down it, you know, unless you had to put now boots. But it's, it's made a big difference. So impact, yes, on the biodiversity, but also on the safety and the looks of the area. We've had a reduction in fire ticking, the people used to come along, um, and this area here was full of garden plants where people just dump them. They go down with their wheelbarrow, sort of late one night, and tip it onto the site. That's all stopped. We've had no fire ticking since then, because people can see, oh, it's not just a lump of old ground, it's now a site and something's happening there. So it's going to be, you know, I mean, obviously with fly tipping, we had to go and get rid of it. So it was in grass going down there, or again, we get the contractor in, so it'll be peel that out of the way. So we haven't had to do that. Um, the trouble of things we've already sort of spoken about, well, we, we continue to monitor that because there is still plants coming up, so we, we, we're actually controlling that at the same time. And we, although we've been limited, we managed to speak to, you know, the residents that we do speak to, they've all been positive. It might not be, wow, yes, I'm going to come down and do this and do that, but nobody's actually said, well, that looks horrible, we don't like that. We've had a few issues around uh, on a couple of estates, we, we piloted a couple of um, areas, and as soon as they got a bit untidy, we had a little bit of, oh, it's looking a bit untidy. So what we did was rather than just say, well, we're going to leave this till September, we spoke with Pembroke County Council, they moved their cutting contract forward a couple of months, so we had a cut, so we got happy residents. And then, what we didn't realise, expecting to happen, was a different group of flowers came through because we'd cut it. So it was a learning curve, so we learned something new again. So finally, so why get involved? Well, it's a way of taking control of your own environment. And I don't mean control as if we want this, we want that, but you, know, you can be involved, you can look at areas and say, oh, this is how we've done it, we went out and said, well, where, where do you think? And then people would come to us and say, well, that, that bit of grass there, couldn't that be done, something be done with that, or couldn't we leave that? So it's a way of getting the people involved and, and the individual actually feeling, well, actually, I'm doing something. Um, we all talk here a lot about well-being, but, I mean, you go down to the pin on there, and you say, oh, I'll go down there, obviously I'm doing the monitoring. But you, you go down there for half an hour, but yeah, I'll go down there, I and it is like the bees, the butterflies. I mean, the photography, my heart was upset. I feel much better, I come back. So, you know, people find that if it's something worth looking at and it's a cheerful place, buzzing away, bright flowers, people come back happier. It makes them feel good. And it's also being part of your community. You can, you know, you're all sitting here together. So, I dare say, quite a few of you know each other already. But there's also other people here with the same interests that you don't know. Well, I bet six months' time, you will know them. If you're all involved in this, you'll get behind, you'll discuss things, and you've got something in common. So, you know, it's being part of things. Um, and learning something new. I've been involved, well, for years in various aspects of sort of biodiversity, wildlife. I'm really into wildlife photography. I can still learn something every year. I went to a meeting with Richard and uh, Holly. Sorry, Holly's here. Yeah, there she is. Um, and then Rogers was was there. I need to chat about something. He's like, I never knew that. I've been I've been involved with like, off and on for 30, 40 years. So learn something new. And the other big thing, which we haven't mentioned yet, is it's help. You know, it's helping the children. You've got to think for the future. Do we want someone actually? Actually, I think Richard touched on it. You know, do we want the kids to sort of look back and go, oh, yeah, that's barren like of nothing. That was a wildflower garden, or that was full of wildflowers and bees 15 years ago. So it's thinking of them, it's also, it gives them, if you can get them interested, they are the future. They will be what taking it forward, not only all of them, you know, we all got our own interests. But if we could get the children involved doing the monitoring and sending their uh, findings off, I mean, one of the good things, one of the, yeah, another thing I learned is I don't send as many as I should, but when I do send them off, if it's something I'm not sure about, 
when I, when I go into the app and I put what I think it is, I get an email pop back that says, yes, you were right. Wow. So that's, you know, that, it's not just us supplying information, but they're very, very helpful. So again, I learn, oh wow, I'm actually, I do know a little bit about that. So really, that's, that's, that's it. I mean, um, I haven't sort of covered you know, how we did it in the, sort of the detail and such. Um, it's not, not the place for that. But all I will say is if we don't help nature now and do our bit now, we'll just lose it. It'll be lost forever. So thank you. I need to just hand over very quickly to, um, to Jana here yeah. um, on behalf of the Towers Council because I promise there are a few words. I want to speak for Mark. Um, thank you for the opportunity to say this. Um, as it happens, Newport Town Council is simultaneously launching two projects which actually do relate very closely to this. The first one is that um, we've appointed Grants and Projects Officer. Mia Siggins, who we've stolen from St. Docs, and we're very proud to have done it. Um, <laughs> all these projects need financing, and, and this project no doubt will have spin off projects that will need financing. There are grants out there for you to get, but it's a difficult process. Mia is an expert, Mia can help you get the grants. We want this grants and projects officer project to be a fantastic benefit to the whole community and the, and the areas around it. So please pass on the word. We're going to be publicising it. Please pass it on to other people and get the community and surrounding areas to make full use of our new project manager, grants and project manager, Nia Siggins. The second one we're doing is about housing. Um, come and talk to Nia now too, as well, because we have the information here. This is a hot topic in Newport. And um, I think a lot of people feel very emotional about planning and housing and the way development's going in Newport. And so Newport Town Council has decided to actually address this issue and find out exactly what the community wants, what kind of planning we want. And this happens to coincide with a greater interest in the Welsh Government in a report called the Scott Report, which I won't go into. But there is a change of attitude, there is a change taking place. Now the main thing about this survey, this is a community-led survey, we want you to make the questions. And the first stage of this process will be for the community, the whole community, anybody who wants to speak to our consultants who are based in Cardiff, they want you to talk to them so that they can formulate the kind of issues that are going to be important in the survey. So you will be making the survey, then we will provide a report and we will put it out to the whole community to give their response to the questions that you have raised in the survey. I hope I'm making sense. So the town council is writing the questions, you will be writing the questions. So we've got leaflets over here. Please take a leaflet or take the information, pass it on to other people. We will be sending, putting it onto Facebook and it will be sent out by email and so on. So please get involved in it because the more we can do with this survey, we're working with PCC, the National Parks, and we're in conversation with the Welsh Government. There could be a change that you can make. And the main thing in this meeting is, environmentally speaking, housing is crucial. The what kind of housing that we have, the effect it has on our communities, the effect it has on the environment. So please take part and take a leaf, but take the information and help us with these two projects. Thank you. Anne Rogers from the uh, Pembrokeshire um, Biodiversity Partnership, Nature Partnership, uh, can't be here. But there is also the Pembrokeshire Wellbeing Assessment going on. Um, I think it might actually come to an end tomorrow, I'm not sure. Um, but that is an opportunity again for you to uh, make your voices heard in terms of what you feel is important in terms of the wellbeing for local people and communities across Pembrokeshire. Um, and that will include obviously things like biodiversity loss, flood risk, air pollution, um, other biodiversity related issues. So again, do please um, engage with that, the Pembrokeshire Wellbeing Assessment, um, Google it and, and see if you can just have your say there. Right, one last thing for me before, uh, before I let you all get cake. Um, at the back there are two trees. 
and this is where I'd really like some input because a lot of people have said we need ideas, we need sites, we need places that we can change. We need, we need, um, we, we, I need. I really would like you to be very much part of this. So over there, and I think it will probably be manned by my partner Naomi and Josh, who are both on the steering group for this project. Um, there are things to go, and I would like some ideas for where you think possibly you would like to offer, or think of some areas to plant trees, or areas that we can plant up um, uh, for, for wildlife and so on. So if you have any thoughts and ideas of where you think we might go and investigate planting for trees, um, bearing in mind that you know, we're not looking on wetlands and we're not looking at wildflower meadows already, um, then please, there's, a, there's an opportunity to write a few ideas down there and hang it on my tree. Um, if you have any ideas for the advice or the workshops or the information you might need that I might like to try and find out for you all, then also write that down, hang it on my tree, any ideas in that regard. I really need help from people in the community, as do we all. Um, so if you have any skills, experience, or volunteering that you might like to do, again, write down what you might like to offer. You might have a particular interest in meadows. You might know all about how to dig wildlife ponds. You might be a handyman that can help me put together some bird boxes and some bug hotels. You could be anything, but if I don't know you're there, then I can't come knocking on your door. Not that I'm going to come knocking on your door, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I, you know, so again, do um, write down your name on, on, and hang it on my tree if there's anything you can offer. There's a vision here. I wrote the vision because I couldn't really get involved with anybody else because of, other, because of lockdown. I'd like to see a network of wildlife friendly spaces and corridors across Newport and its environs, connecting town and countryside, supported, maintained and enjoyed by residents and visitors alike, providing climate change resilience, but also colour and birdsong, calm and joy and well-being for all. That's what I'd like to get out of this project, but you've probably got your own ideas. So spend a couple of minutes cogitating over a cup of tea and a piece of choice cake and think, what's my vision? Just a word or a line. What do I actually want from this? But just, just have a flight of fancy. It may never be realised, but if you don't have a vision, you're not going to achieve. So again, just a word or two. If you fancy sharing your vision with me, hang it on my tree. And then finally, what are we going to do ourselves as individuals? I've got a little sheet there, a little kind of card that says, what am I going to do as part of the um, Newport for Nature project? What's my pledge to myself or to the community? What am I going to do? Just think about it. OK, I'm going to dig a pot. I'm going to plant a, a, a pollinator flower meadow. I'm just going to put up a window box with some, whatever it might be, big, small, a pledge to yourself and to us, an opportunity just to write it down. Put it in concrete, black and white, and then maybe it will just prompt you. And you can hang it on my tree, or if need be, you can take it in your back pocket um, and look at it in six months' time and say, oh yeah, I've got to do that. that I want to do that. That's my contribution to this project. So that's all happening with my trees. They're not trees, they're just branches. It's goat willow. It's not trees I've cut down. They were just prunings from our hedge. So, <laughs> so, so I promise you that just, it's all right. But hang it on my tree. Um, uh, yeah, just, just, I'd like the input from all of you here and for the rest of the community. There's also a little questionnaire thing, very simple, four questions, just so that I can see where we're at now in terms of our knowledge and what we've got. Oh, you've done that. Thank you very much for doing that already, apparently. Thank you. Um, and then finally, I just want to say again, thank you to the speakers that have come here today. Really fantastic, so inspiring to hear what's going on, what could go on, and what we can all do to help. A reiteration of the fact that we've also got um, Kevin from the Zoning Pollinators from the from the Botanic Park. We've also got the West Wales Biodiversity Centre um, here with Colin and Polly, and we've also got Matt Horgan and Richard Wheeler, who can talk to you a little bit more about the wildlife gardening aspect of things. Clive and his meadows. Um, I think Nathan, is that you there? I can see Nathan's joined us from the Wildlife Trust. I'm sure he won't mind to have a word with him. Holly's already had a, had, a, had a shout out over there from Comarish Renewable Energy. Mike James is here as well, uh, the, the um, chair of the County Council and Dogmas and so on. So again, another person to talk to. So there's lots of information in the room amongst of yourselves, of course. So, um, so please do just kind of soak it all up, have cake, have tea, and talk to people. Uh, oh, and thank you to all the cake makers, and thank you to my steering group, and thank you to my volunteers. And, um, and I'll, I'll just stop now, but thank you so much for coming, and, and just be in touch. Find out what you need to do, put down your ideas, and, uh, and, then, and then get my newsletter, and then all will become clear over the next 18 months. But thank you all for your support and your enjoyment. Thank you.
I'm Kevin McGinn, I work at the National Botanic Garden of Wales for a project called uh, Growing the Future, uh, which is all about sustainable horticulture, gardening for wildlife. Uh, we've got a scheme working with growers all across Wales called the Saving Pollinators Assurance Scheme. Um, so all the growers grow their plants without peat and without pesticides. Uh, they display logos on the plants that are proven to be good for pollinators. Uh, there's lots of information on, on the Botanic Garden website. Clive Morgan. I plant trees, or many trees, in memory of good friends who have died. And uh, this is the next one to get planted. Uh, the moss is to remind me that in a past existence I was really keen on mosses, and it's one of the things I'm going to do in the next 12 months is reinvigorate my knowledge. And the stone uh, is to remind people that when they're trying to cultivate their wildflower meadows or their, um, uh, their little bits of woodland, to look out for the rocks. Now this isn't an archaeological specimen. It looks a bit like one, but uh, in one of my plantations I've found five hammer stones authenticated. So uh, that's the advantage of getting close to the site. Hello, I'm, I'm Mike from the St Dogmails. Um, I'm helping with the uh, Community Council Biodiversity Project in St Dogmails. We've been ooh, running it for Seriously, for the last 18 months, but over the last seven or eight years, um, we initially, uh, another councillor, a colleague, um, started removing uh, Japanese knotweed, and then we moved on to uh, clearing the area of Himalayan balsam. Um, we also had the Orchard Project run outside of the council. It was very, very sort of well supported. So when that finished in 2019, we decided as a council that we would uh, sort of take on part of it. So the council owned land, as much as possible now, is run for the benefit of biodiversity. Um, the aim, we've worked with Pembrokeshire County Council um, on, because some, some of the land sort of verges is their responsibility. So we work closely with them to try and sort of work together. Um, and we've reduced the cutting on the verges. We've seen a massive increase in, in pollinators. Um, it's got quite a lot of interest from you know, obviously residents now. If you go down to what, what's the Pinog, which is on the sort of estuary front at St Dog Mails, it was just a sort of barren area. It's an SSSI um, for uh, numerous reasons, but the, it was just being cut sort of once a month. So we've now left it from April. We don't touch it at all. We go down and monitor it until September when it's cut again. Um, we normally have volunteers that clear the horizons away. But you see, if you go down there now, it's full of butterflies, bees, and usually humans with their children <laughs> actually enjoying it for a change. So it's gone from a barren area to um, somewhere that's uh, now a pleasure to actually sort of be. Mm -hmm. 